heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 268, covering the week of June 28th through July 2nd, 2021. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Like our Gab page at Abbeville Institute and subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also find all of those social media accounts on our webpage. We have a new and updated webpage. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but go to abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. While you're there, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook, Exploring the Southern Tradition by 20 Abbeville Institute Scholars. It's got a new look. The webpage does. You'll find our information on our mobile app at the top of the page. You find information on our upcoming events, uh, our Abbeville Academy, which is a great thing. It is an awesome service. We have these webinars that we do once a month, and we'll probably start marketing those more on the web page as we release them and let people come in that way too. But um, you get our information on upcoming events. We've got our Abbeville Academy where, Academy where we have these webinars for sale after the fact. They're about five bucks more, but still, if you missed them, you can get them at Abbeville. It's abbevilleacademy.org. We already have several up there. We're going to have another one up within a, a couple of days here. Uh, with the most recent one with Marco Bassani. So uh, you're going to want to get that as well. Uh, it also gives you information on, on the Abbeville Institute, uh, all the things that we do. You've got our podcast there. You've got our videos. So much good stuff on that webpage. And if you give us that email address, you get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday, or sometimes uh, if we miss a couple of days during the week, we'll put them on the weekend. But you'll get that email five days a week. Now, some people have said that's too much. But all we're doing is sending you our, our daily article, the stuff that we put on the website. So if you just go check out the website, uh, you can see that as well. But that email address is also our lifeline. As social media is getting harder and harder to do, we need the email list to stay in touch with you and ensure that we can communicate with you on a regular basis. So when you go out and you give us an email list, also give us your name and uh, contact information as well. We don't sell any of this information. We don't give this information away. This is ours to keep. We don't let people know who you are. It's just for us to have so we can ensure that we can help uh, you get our information and also you can help us explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. If you do like what we do, consider a tax-deductible donation to the Institute. You can click on that Donate tab now at abbevilleinstitute.org. It's right there at the top of it. Just click on that. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. It's all right there for you. So, um, you know, consider that. If you like the podcast, if you like the, the website, if you like our webinars, if you like our conferences, we got our summer school coming up in just a couple of weeks now. Summer school, and, and of course, we're sold out of that. So um, that was good. We're looking at trying to do some things differently with that because there is such an interest in these things now. So uh, the Institute is growing. It's growing in ways that are just I mean, remarkable to me and to anybody else who's been affiliated with the Institute since 2002. We're almost at our 20th anniversary, which is amazing. That'll be next year. We'll probably do something with that. We haven't decided yet. But um, we've got a lot of good stuff this week. But I want to start with this. We, we talked about the website and also Gab. So the first piece of the week was written by yours truly about the situation. I talked about it last week on the podcast, but not everyone gets the podcast, so maybe this is the first time you're listening to it and you're seeing that article. But just to recap, uh, we published a couple of things on Facebook that led to our page being unpublished, and neither one was really a violation of anything. Any, any reasonable person would look at the things that we did and say, well, that's just stupid. That's just big tech being stupid big tech, and a bunch of progressives don't know what they're talking about. The most egregious, though, was an article that we wrote, or published, I should say, by Jim Peterson, uh, a skeleton in the progressive Yankee or Yankee progressive closet, um, talking about the second Ku Klux Klan. And we put, we put an image there from some sheet music from 1923, which is a readily available image across the web. I mean, this is a historical image to highlight the point that he was making in the piece that the Klan in the 1920s was so focused solely on the United States. The image has Uncle Sam with a U.S. flag and the Klan behind him. This was solely designed to show that this Klan, that was the, high, the zenith of Klan activity in America, and generally the Klan is centered in other parts of the United States other than the South, is 
an American institution, not a Southern institution, and that all the demonization of the flag as being part of the Klan and all this stuff is just ridiculously stupid. So we did it as as an, a critical piece of the Klan. We weren't we were critical of the Klan, of course, as we should be. Uh, we were we weren't supportive of it in any way, any any formation of the group. So, but Facebook decided that that image was too much and that it was too uh, too nasty. And so they unpublished our page. That violates their own set of community standards. And I want to read that because I think it's important for everyone to hear that part of it. Looking into this uh, and what their community standards actually are. So from their website, we recognize that people sometimes share content that includes someone else's hate speech to condemn it or to raise awareness. That's exactly what we were doing. We were raising awareness that this part of the Klan was focusing on the U.S. flag. In other cases, speech that might otherwise violate our standards can be used self-referentially or in an empowering way. Our policy is designed to allow room for these types of speech, but we require people to clearly indicate their intent. If the intention is unclear, we may remove content. Well, the clear indication of the intent was just by clicking on the link to the article and reading it. So we did exactly what Facebook suggested we do in that, and they still removed the content, and unpublished our page. There's no recourse in this, by the way, um, at all. There's no recourse at all. Um, but Facebook decided to take this action. It's probably permanent. I don't know. So we went over to Gab. Gab, of course, is a free speech platform if you want to follow us on social media, Twitter, we don't do much with. Um, we can. We might start doing more with it. But again, there, we're going to face the same hurdles ultimately. The funny thing about all this, of course, and what I pointed out in this piece on, on Facebook and Old Glory, is that you have now, you have a situation where um, you've got leftists saying the flag needs to come down. Now, We've been critical of the U.S. flag for years at the Abbeville Institute, being, I mean, something that's unnecessary. Southerners have long, I mean, look, Southerners didn't celebrate July 4th for decades in Mississippi, and rightfully so because July 4th was seen as the capitulation of Vicksburg and the destruction of, I mean, just shelling innocent civilians. It was horrible, so they didn't celebrate it for decades. And, of course, U.S. flags were not welcome in in uh, the South for a long period of time, or at least, you know, they, they were people were more suspicious. Now, World War II changed a lot of that. World War II changed the way people thought about uh, the, uh, the United States, American nationalism, and, of course, people started flying U.S. flags. But now you're seeing we've got the, the runner, or, uh, I'm sorry, the shot put athlete, uh, who refused to, uh, who turned her back to the U.S. flag as the national anthem being played. And look, I, again, I wrote a piece for Chronicles critical of having the national anthem at every single thing under the sun. I mean, you could make a case for the Olympics because you're representing the United States. So obviously, in every, every country does it, uh, they have their national anthem played. So, I mean, this is one place that you could see that this was necessary. Uh, I, I mean, but before you go to a bowling match or something, it's unnecessary to have the national anthem played there. Regardless, um, we've got a real problem in America of uh, this American nationalism, and we've pointed this out at the Institute. So I don't think that this this Macy Gray who made this point should be banned from anywhere for saying what she believes, nor should anyone else be banned from any platform that has speech for saying what they believe. Speech, by design, is going to offend somebody. If you're not offending somebody, you're not saying things that are true. right? So by design, some speech is going to offend somebody. And I think that's the part that is the most disappointing thing. We didn't really even do anything to violate their standards. And if you, one of the other things we did, of course, is post a Confederate battle flag, which they took, imme- took down immediately, so that's a violation of their standards. An American symbol that's a recognized symbol of the South. Now, of course, the, you can't even call, um, when you're talking about weather anymore, the Weather Channel has now decided that Dixie Alley is, is 
uh, insensitive to people. We're talking about Mississippi and Alabama and these Dixie Alley, which is, you know, this hot area of tornado activity in the spring. Nope, you can't call it that. I don't know what they're going to call it anymore. Uh, we have Tornado Alley in the Midwest, but you can't even call it Dixie Alley anymore. That's uh, that's insensitive. So, I mean, what are we going to do? But the Confederate flag was seen as the... This is why we use it in our daily dose of Dixie. It's the flag of Dixie. People called it the Dixie flag. Uh, you had uh, Irish groups that would use it. I mean, you had Europe. It was all over Europe. You would have all these people using this flag. And so all we're doing is just capitalizing on that and saying, look, this is still a symbol of the South. It always has been a symbol of the South, and it should remain a symbol of the South. Now, the U.S. flag is coming under attack from the left, which they've always attacked the flag. I mean, you go back to the 1960s, they attacked it, and they burned it, and desecrated it, and did all kinds of things. This is why the Congress passed a law in 1968 making it illegal. That was later ruled unconstitutional. You've had presidents talk about banning the flag, and uh, I'm sorry, banning flag desecration and other things. So, but th- it really is a symbol of cancel culture. I mean, now it's not just, we talked about this here, it's not just going to be Confederate symbols. It's not just going to be Confederate monuments. They want it all. They want it all to go. So if you're a conservative in America and you somehow supported in any way any of this stuff from the beginning, you are part of the problem. I'm talking about major conservatives that have gone out and said, well, I can understand taking down Confederate monuments. Really? You can? Well, then don't cry when they come for your, for your union monuments, for the U.S. flag and everything else, because that's exactly what's going to happen. Because that flag is not without controversy. There are people all around the world that look at that flag as a flag of empire, imperialism. And so, I mean, you say it doesn't mean that, but that doesn't mean it's not true what they're saying. It's the arguments that are being used now to defend the U.S. flag are the same kind of arguments being used oftentimes to defend the Confederate battle flag and other things. We don't say it means that. We think it means this. Well, that's not what I think. Well, this is what the left is now doing to the U.S. flag. So it's, I mean, it's it's interesting how this is being turned back on them. But we know the Union flag has been used uh, for violent means, right? And the piece that we ran on Tuesday, Lincoln and the Border States by Terry Halsey, it's a great review of a book, Lincoln and the Border States Preserving the Union. Now, uh, the Border States, of course, are uh, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky. Uh, And so these are the areas that are often pointed out as the real meat of the Lincolnian agenda for floating some different ideas. Now, this book came out in 2014, and I did uh, my—and Missouri is also in this group— I did my dissertation on a U.S. senator from Delaware, uh, James Byard. And James Byard was one of the few— senators in the United States Senate during the war that opposed the Lincoln administration. He made some really great speeches against the Lincoln administration. And one of these days, I'm going to publish publish that. I'll, I'll get it out there so people can see what he was doing. It's fantastic. He also wrote a book on the Constitution. It's really good, right? I mean, this is a guy that was very important that nobody knows anything about. One of the things that I thought was really interesting that Terry Halsey pulls out of this of course, is the fact that the aim of the war was to enforce the Union and to preserve the Republican Party. And, of course, the point that these border states uh, were more pro-secession than what people realize. But I want to get to this part where he talks about Delaware, because this really is interesting. You see, a lot of people don't realize when you talk about emancipation, we just had June 19th now uh, celebrated as a, as a federal holiday, supposedly the end of slavery in America at that point, but it really isn't. We all know that. But now you have this federal holiday, and what's really interesting about that is that it, it, Lincoln was floating emancipation plans before he issued the Emancipation Proclamation that were rejected. But Lincoln's own plans would have allowed for the continuation of slavery into the 1890s. And when you say this, of course, uh, Paul Escott, who wrote a book, What Shall We Do with the Negro, um, which was Lincoln's quote, is quoted as saying, look, Lincoln would have allowed slavery into the 1890s. He didn't care. And of course, oh, no, no, no. Nobody talks about this anymore. But if you look at what Davis, who wrote this book, brings out, and I knew about this because uh, of working with Delaware, but it's not often brought up. 
And I'm going to quote from it. And Halsey quotes from this, so I'm going to do it too. On about November 26, 1861, one week before Congress met in its regular session, the president completed the draft of two options for such a bill. This was compensated emancipation. He gave the draft to Delaware Congressman George P. Fisher. Now, George P. Fisher is an interesting case because he won the election. He won the election because of uh, fraud, essentially. And then when you get to the elections that were held during the war, the only reason that, I mean, Fisher was, was, was crazy. The man wanted troops brought in, and they were. I mean, Delaware was an armed camp during the elections, and they were intimidating people, changing ballots. I mean, it was just some really nasty stuff going on in Delaware. He gave the draft to Delaware Congressman George P. Fisher to present to his friends in the Delaware legislature. Also, Fisher consulted the largest slave owner, and this is not in the quote, but Fisher consulted the largest slave owner in Delaware, who happened to be a Republican, about the plan. Both options provided for the allocation of 6% federal bonds totaling $719,200 to, to be distributed in five equal annual installments as the process of freedom unfolded. The first option called for the phased ending of slavery, with one-fifth of the adult slave population becoming free by mid-1862, and the remaining four-fifths by 1867. So look at that. After the war. I mean, we didn't know how long the war was going to last in 1861, but 1862, now Delaware had about 3,000 slaves. So this would have freed, what, a fifth of those? 600 slaves? And then the rest would have still been there for the remainder of the war until 1867. The second option provided for a far longer period of phase emancipation, extending to 1893. Both options required that the state adopt a system of apprenticeship, not to extend beyond the age of 21 years for males, nor 18 for females, for all minors whose mothers were not free at the time of birth. The president admitted, on reflection, I like number two the better, since it expanded the period for the completion of emancipation, though that meant Delaware would not be required to abolish slavery before 1893. Now, why did this fail? When the largest slaveholder in Delaware was consulted about the cost, Lincoln's idea for how much he was willing to pay was far less than what this individual said it was worth. And so when these plans were presented to Congress, the U.S. Congress, they balked at the cost. Lincoln, though, as it says here, was willing to let slavery exist until the 1890s. He was consistent on this up until the day he died, essentially. He might have modified that a little bit near the end, but he was consistent. None of the of Lincoln's plans, Hawley says, for compensated emancipation were ever adopted, neither those of the for the border states, nor the one suggested nationally two months before the war's end. Harris has not discussed the contradiction between Lincoln's exigency for war, purportedly for the abolition of slavery, and his willingness to wait up to 32 years to abolish it peacefully. Right? I mean, so he's, Halsey's pointing out that Harris is a moron. He's the righteous cause myth. But yet he doesn't square this. I mean, if, if the war is to end slavery, why was Lincoln allowing it till 1893? Then it should have just ended right then. So this is a, an important point to make, and I think one that's often missed as we talk about these things with emancipation and how that works, how it would work in the southern states. So I like this review. It's very good. Now, thinking about this idea of Dixie and the Weather Channel in March saying that Dixie was no longer welcome. You can't say Dixie Alley anymore. Uh, the piece on Wednesday by Boyd Cathy, uh, when Bing Crosby sang Dixie, it's a, it's a movie. The title of the movie is Dixie, and Bing Crosby is the lead role, and he sings Dixie along with other things. But um, this is a fantastic movie. It came out in 1943 in color. And Bing Crosby being one of the most prominent household names in America at that point, going on in a major motion picture and singing Dixie and promoting this part of American culture, which even the review said, this is great. I mean, these rousing little tunes, people like this stuff. I mean, saying all of that, is, uh, is an important part of this. And I think Boyd does a good job of, of pointing out here, Dr. Kathy, pointing out here the, uh, the important cultural statement this makes. 
Because you couldn't get away with making this film today at all. You couldn't make this film. To have a prominent major singer go on and do something so overtly pro-Southern. And Bing Crosby wasn't Southern. But to do it, you couldn't get away with it. When the Weather Channel says you can't even use the word Dixie anymore. When the chicks were the Dixie chicks, now they're just the chicks. Now, that's amazing to me because chick used to be a term that was a negative term for women. But now that's okay, but Dixie's bad. Uh, I mean, this is just ridiculous stuff. We're in clown world. We're in the age of clown world where nothing makes sense. Everything is just language. This language is bad, but now it's good. Now it's this. Is a, we, you can't say anything anymore. But I like this piece because, of course, it brings up this cultural side of things. Uh, Dr. Kathy says, this, he says, as the last scene unfolded and Crosby began singing Dixie, joined in by the chorus and then the audience and the music swells, emotion came over me and I wanted to stand and join in as well. He says, that has been and continues to be the power of this song, this part of our history an indication of the power of music to evoke the most sublime emotions, the love of country, of family, of heritage. And the film Dixie does it justice that will warm the heart of any Southerner or patriotic American. That said, the piece we ran on on uh, Thursday, Cousin uh, Lucius, is uh, from, I'll take my stand, it's a new writer, someone who hasn't written for us before, uh, his name is uh, Charles Roberts. He's a doctor, uh, a medical doctor. And he wrote this piece because he was talking about what he loves about um, I'll Take My Stand. He calls it Thoreau's, the southern version of Thoreau's Walden. Um, and this is a personal story. He says when he and his brother Clifford attended Vanderbilt University, it hosted... 50 years after, a symposium on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Agrarian Manifesto. Three of the t original 12 essayists attended, Lyle Lanier, Andrew Nelson Lytle, and Robert Penn Warren, the poet perhaps the most famous, along with the poets John Crow Ransom and Alan Tate, who were deceased. He says, I had the program framed. It was still in the air. My favorite of the 12 essays is The Life and Death of Cousin Lucius by John Donald Wade, a story about a boy in South Carolina who moved with his family to Georgia in 1850, was too young to participate in the Civil War, but married and raised a family in what Henry Grady called the New South. This favoritism lies in the observation that the experiences of Lucius, written in the third person, are similar to experiences of members of the Roberts and Stewart families of Oxford, Georgia. In reading the story, I'm reading about them, my own family. Cousin Lucius reminds me especially of Joseph Spencer Stewart, Jr., who established the high school educational system in Georgia after the Civil War. His tombstone reads, The state was his campus. And so here's a personal connection to a story, and this is important about the Southern tradition. It's a personal connection to people, place, and things. It's what Boyd Cathy was talking about with Dixie. A personal connection. That's what the South has and the Southern tradition has for so many people. And why I've said on this program, number one, that to try to break that is evil. It's evil personified. To say somebody's ancestors are evil is to call them corruption of blood. This is evil. You don't do it. But that personal connection to people and place, and the South has it more than any other group. Southerners have it more than any other group in America. And I think that's something that we often forget. There are other places in the United States that have it. There's no doubt about it. I mean, people are atta attached to New England. People are attached to the West and the mountains. My grandfather from uh, often talked about his mountains in Colorado. He loved them. He didn't want to live anywhere else. The mountains were what he wanted. But certainly you have uh, this attachment to people in place that's so important. He says, the best characterization of Lucius by John Donald Wade comes early in the essay, however, when Lucius, near the end of college, Emory, visits the state university as a delegate from his fraternity to a meeting where he meets Alexander Stevens, the former U.S. senator from Georgia and later vice president of the Confederacy. Lucius observes his, this legendary personality and also admires the many student imitators who spoke so eloquently when he was sure that he could not speak of anything in final earnest without tending to stutter a little. Lucius begins to understand more about himself and the world, realizing that his virtues were of the sort that can be recognized at the entire value only after one has endured the trampling of years which reduce a man to a patriarch. 
Stories of individuals are sometimes more powerful than abstract philosophical essays. Cousin Lucius was based in reality, I may say. It is a beautiful, if not tragic, tale of an individual possessing the classic virtues, forced to adapt to a machine-like transition in society. And I think that's, again, where he's looking at this and saying, this is something that is, it resonates with him because it's this, the, and the, the humanity of the South being ground down by modernity. And we see it. I mean, modernity grinds everything down. Part of woke cancel culture is one side of, of one half of the population grinding everything down on the other side. You can't have it anymore. You, you're just corruption of blood. You're all evil. You're all bad. And this is why on Friday, Walt Garlington suggested a new July 4th resolution to think about the South in different ways. He says, one may go a step further and say that the SJWs are merely the latest iteration of New England progressives, beginning with the Pilgrim Gnostics and on to the more secularized and or apostate Yankees with their many isms, abolitionism, communism, feminism, prohibitionism, Shakerism, Mormonism, etc. Thus, what we are seeing is the Yankee ideology devouring itself. Those who hold to the earlier mid 19th century Lincolnian version, Hillsdale, Talk Radio, Victor Davis, Hanson, Fox News, are at war with the current woke iteration. The South stands aloof from deracinated Yankee Americanism. She began not as a project to build something new, but as an effort to, to Englishmen to continue the rural life they knew, the only difference being the ability to advance a little financially. This is why so many old things have survived here in the South, the architecture of the English manor house and the Celtic cabin, as well as cl classical Greek and Roman architecture, classical literature, literature, the African banjo, the Bible and saints days, quilting and basket weaving, and so forth. He says, it behooves us then to do what the South failed to do in the first war of Northern aggression, to find enough unity to fend off our enemies. And so he implores people, leaders in the South, to think about a new independence. He says, let this, he says, this July 4th, let the South do something meaningful on Independence Day. This July 4th, let the South turn away from the tired, worn-out, delusional boasting of Yankee civilization. This July 4th, let the South declare her independence from Yankee do domination of all kinds. We have to remember that Independence Day, and since we're getting to that point, there would be no Independence Day without the South. I mean, it was proposed by Virginia. The document itself was written by a Virginian, the Declaration of Independence. Virginia seceded before the rest of the other states. So did Maryland. It was Patrick Henry who was who thundered, give me liberty or give me death. I mean, uh, we know that there are great patriots, of course, in Massachusetts, but without Washington, without Jefferson, without Patrick Henry, without Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter, without the Rutledges of South Carolina, without the victory at Hanging Rock or the Battle of King's Mountain, without these things, there's no independence. And we could go on and on about the South and how important it was in the American War for Independence. One of the greatest tragedies of modern culture is that New England gets to call themselves the Patriots when <laughs> they wouldn't have won anything without being rescued by the South. Southerners were more patriotic in many ways than New Englanders, but... This is, this is the point. So part of the point of the Institute, exploring what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, is this talk of place and people and culture and tradition. And that's why I love these pieces. And we hope the new website and what we've done, and you're, well, let me talk about that for a second. The new website, of course, is only possible because we had donations from individuals and because of your financial support. Now, we had somebody say they can't, download the articles. Of course you can still download the articles. It's all still there. Um, it always is going to be there. Uh, and so you can copy and paste them and download these articles all you want. We still have our email list, but we hope that you like the new look of the website. We're working out some kinks. We always will continue to do that. But every time you help us and you donate to us, the videos we produce this year on Lincoln, on Calhoun, on Confederate monuments, the things that we've done, and we're going to continue to do those things. We haven't, we haven't stopped that. We just are working behind the scenes to try to get some other things done. We've got another project we're going to start working on 
there are some real important things we've got for the future for the Institute. And every time you donate, even just a little bit, if you can just donate $5 a month, it does help. If that's all you've got, if you've only got $3 a month, that helps too. Whatever you got, it helps. What is the Southern tradition worth to you for Dr. Uh, for Dr. Roberts, it's that connection to people in place. For Boyd Cathy, it's it's Dixie. It's connection to that too. I mean, he he had gen- descended from a long line of Southerners. So again, it's that connection to people in place. For others, it's simply the principles of Jeffersonian, the Jeffersonian tradition. What does that mean? Maybe there's no. You could love the Southern tradition and not be from the South. Maybe there's no connection to the people there, but you love the Southern tradition and you understand it because you have connection to your people and who you are. And that's important too. And it's always about thinking, internalizing this. What can we do to worry about our own back door? It's something that I think is exclusively Southern. Sweep around your own back porch, worry about that first, and then everyone else is uh, irrelevant. And I think Southerners did that for a long time, and it's something that the South should continue to look at doing. So again, I hope you enjoy the new website, Working Out the Kinks. We'll get it all worked out. Hope you enjoy that. Hope you enjoy this podcast. And until next time, good day.